Well, welcome back to our Read Through the Bible, and today we're picking up in Job chapter 9. Now, you will remember that the book of Job begins with the first two chapters, a prologue to Job. And in these two chapters, there's an encounter between God and Satan. And then after the first two chapters, you come to this second section of the book of Job, which really encompasses chapters 3 through 31. And there's a cycle of three sets of dialogue speeches between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. So as we pick up in Job chapter 9, Job is responding to Bildad, who has been rather harsh in condemning Job for his pride and his hidden sinfulness and wickedness, which he has not repented. And so in the first verse, Job acknowledges, I know that this is so. I know that, that I'm not totally blameless, but there's more to what's going on than, than just this fact. Um, but he shoots back and says to Bildad, but how can a man be in the right before God? Think of that question. How can a man be right before God? How can a man be in the right before God? And the only answer to that question, the only way any of us can ever be right before God is through Jesus. And this whole book, again, is filled with parts of it that are looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, little types and kind of hidden analogies, and then some, some very direct uh, concepts that are looking towards the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, and then Job goes on, how can we answer God? Uh, and then he asks this question, who makes the stars? And he comes up and he asks, actually lists three constellations. He uh, lists Pleiades, Orion, and he mentions something called the Chambers of the South. Now this is fascinating because the Chambers of the South would be constellations in the southern hemisphere. Job would have no ability to see these. In other words, by experience, he wouldn't know that these were there. So this has to be revealed to him by the Spirit. Amazing, isn't it? Like God's Spirit takes things and gives it to writers of Scripture. Sometimes they don't even know, but they are writing what God's Spirit is leading them to write. Um, Job goes on, I can't I can't stop him. I can't even see him. Uh, speaking of the invisible nature of God, so how can I contend with him? I can never measure up to God. And then in verse 33 of chapter 9, he makes this incredible statement, this verse, there is no umpire between us. There, there's no umpire. There's no mediator between, between me and God. I, I need a mediator. Um, I can never measure up. And this points directly to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Remember that verse? There is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Job says there is no umpire. I'm praying for an umpire. I'm praying for a mediator. Good news, because Jesus is coming. And then in uh, Job chapter 10, Job continues. Job here is frustrated. Why do you contend with me, God? Um, you created me. Um, and, and it's kind of, you have this going back and forth in Job between these, these divine nuggets pointing to divine truths and to Jesus, and then kind of falling back into this, this loathing and self-despair. Um, he again turns to question God, why did you create me? And then in verse 18, he describes uh, death as the land of darkness, kind of reminds us, for example, that hell is described as outer darkness, but not with Jesus. For in John 14, 6, Jesus will say what? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And again, this entire book is full of those allusions pointing to Christ. Well, in uh, ver chapter 11, you get the third of Job's friend. His name is Zophar, Zophar the Namathite, um, uh, probably from somewhere in Edom or Arabia, not 100% sure. But he accuses Job of saying too much. Job, you talk too much. Um, you're, you're ignorant of, of God's ways. Uh, very unkind words here. He, he tells Job to repent. And then in chapter 11, verse 15, he makes this statement. Listen to what Zophar says. If you will repent and do what's right, then indeed you could lift up your face without moral defect. Now, a couple of interesting things about that. You could lift up your face without moral defect. Uh, first of all, 
God has already proclaimed uh, in the first couple chapters that Job is blameless and righteous and one that hates evil. But God is saying this not on the basis of the fact that Job is perfect. Yes, Job is a good man, comparatively speaking. But on the basis of Jesus Christ, it almost seems as though far said, if you repent and do the right thing, then you could lift your face up without moral defect. Now, let me ask this question. How much changing would I have to do to be perfect in God's eyes, to present my case before God, look at me, God, I'm holy, I'm righteous, accept me? Well, that's only possible in Jesus Christ. There's always this mentality, you know, man needs to reform himself. If man could just produce good works, yes, Works are a result, as Ephesians will say um, uh, in Ephesians 2.10. You know, we're created for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. But um, uh, the whole concept here that's reiterated is that so far that's not going to work. Um, you can't make yourself righteous and present yourself without moral defect. That only comes through Jesus. And then uh, Zophar goes on to say, but the wicked will not escape. That's true, but Zophar is coming with a very unkind spirit and attitude. We need to be careful about hurting people, how we come across to them. Well, in, <coughs> excuse me. in Job chapter 12, um, Job states his friends are conceited, lack empathy, um, don't understand the mystery of the nature of God. Uh, Job nor his friends knew again about Job 1 and 2, the, the, the heavenly encounter between God and Satan. And Job goes on to say, in verses 7 and following in chapter 12, learn from creation. God gives life. God takes life. Old men should have wisdom. You guys are older, but you're not displaying much wisdom. Um, Job reminds his insensitive friends that God is omniscient. That is, God is all-knowing. God is omnipotent. That is, God, all, God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. And sometimes we don't understand exactly what God may be up to. God's up to something, but Sometimes we don't fully comprehend, and we have to be obedient in those situations. Um, and he administers his sovereignty sometimes for reasons that we may not fully comprehend or understand. And then in Job 13, Job says to his friends, you mis misrepresent God, you're, you're not being honest about God, you're worthless physicians. Um, I want to hear from God myself. And he reminds his friends, you're going to give account to God for your words, uh, he says in in 13. That's very important that the Bible tells us that we will give account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. And then in the middle of all of this, in Job chapter 13, verse 15, you have this incredible proclamation by Job. Even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even though he kills me, I will put my hope in him. Um, and he says, I know I'll be vindicated. You know, all this is looking forward to Jesus, but only Jesus can vindicate us. Well, in uh, 1320 to the end of uh, chapter 14, Job now begins to address God directly. Uh, and so uh, you come down in verse four, uh, verse 20 and following, Job is asking for relief from God. Um, again, an explanation of why am I going through all this. Job demonstrates deep but very perplexed faith. You know, he's got deep faith, but he's very perplexed as to what God is doing. And then in Job 14, you have some, some great quotes found in the 14th chapter of the book of Job. Um, the first verse of chapter 14, uh, man who is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Well, that's true. You know, very, very famous verse. You number our days, so we need to make our days count because our days are indeed limited. And then he asks the question in chapter 14, verse 14, Maybe the most significant question in the book of Job, maybe the most significant question of the Bible. If a man dies, will he live again? 14. Job 14, 14. If a man dies, will he live again? And then he says in verse 15, you will call and I will answer you. And he's, he's speaking here of life after death. If a man calls, will he live again? And yes, he's going to call us and and. We will rise from the dead. Remember that, that great scene in, in, in the Gospel of John? Lazarus, come forth. Just think of, of when we are indeed brought up to be with Jesus Christ, the rapture. Uh, and so there's this incredible scene. If a man dies, will he live again? Absolutely yes, in Jesus Christ. There must be something beyond this world in this age. So uh, 
chapter 14 brings us to the end of the first cycle of uh, dialogue between Job and his three friends. Well, chapter 15 opens a second uh, set of uh, dialogue speeches. And here again, Eliphaz the uh, Temanite begins this as he did the first cycle. Um, he accuses Job of irreverent speech, you know. Um, your own lips testify against you. Do you only hear from God? You're not listening to us. We're hearing from God. Kind of this, this old trick that Satan uses to get two people together. God said this to me. God said this to me. Well, you know, yeah, uh, we need to be careful when we say God has given me something to tell you. We need to make sure that's not out of the realm of how God works, but we need to be very careful how we do this. Um, and so he goes on, Eliphaz does, God is holy, man is sinful. True, but there's a certain arrogance with which Eliphaz is addressing Job. And I would say to Eliphaz, physician, heal yourself. Practice what you preach. Um, he goes on in this, uh, the wicked suffer. You have wickedness, Job, so you need to repent. Don't let yourself be deceived. You know, we need to be careful that we say the truth and say it the right way. You know, um, uh, kind of Ephesians 4.25, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word is good for edification according to the need of the moment. Well, this wasn't really probably what Job needed to hear right here. Well, in chapter 16, um, Job accuses his friends of, of being sorry comforted, Comforters, if the cases were reversed, I would at least show you comfort. Um, and he said, God has exhausted me. God has shriveled me up. Again, going back to this loathing and, and lament. Um, God has become my adversary, handed me over to ruffians, you. Um, but yet in all this, in verse 19 of, of chapter 16, he's going to speak of his trust being real. He said, even, listen to this, even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate on high. Beautiful passage of Scripture. Even now, I know there is someone making intercession for me. There's an advocate on high. There's a witness. Who can that be but Jesus? Oh, that a man might plead with God for me. That's Jesus. Okay, so we come to Job chapter 17, and Job has come to the point now of seeing his friends as mockers and enemies. Uh, he calls God to promise God promised me, make an oath that you will hear me. I think sometimes we feel like, God, listen to me. Just, just I want to talk to you, God. <laughs> it's ironic, isn't it? We don't take advantage of prayer, but we complain that God is not listening to us. So Job continues to lament his condition. But in verse 10 of 17, he says to his friends, I do not find a wise man among you. Kind of, you know, it's sad, you know. God give us wise people to give us counsel to lead in our churches and to just individually counsel each other. Pray for God's wisdom. And then come to the last chapter we're going to look at now, uh, chapter 18. And here you have Bildad the Shuhite. Bildad, the shortest man in the Bible, Shuhite, get it? Ha ha, well, we'll move on from that one. But um, Bildad is probably from Arabia, uh, but he is probably the harshest of Job's three friends. Um, and so it's really getting really bad now. Job, shut up and listen. Repent of your wickedness. Kind of friends like this. Who needs enemies? Um, you've been caught in your own sins, thrown into the net by your own feet. Look at you, Job. Verse 21, listen to this. And he's talking to Job now where he says this. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. You know, he said. This is what happens to wicked and those that do not know God. Now, his appraisal of Job is very different than God's. Go back to uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Here in both of these, God says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him who is upright, blameless, and turns away from evil. So clearly Bildad is not correct. But Job is focusing that he does have an advocate, and that advocate is Jesus. Brother Mike's going to deal with next week, but just a couple of passages in next week. Job would say, oh, that my words were written, they were inscribed in a book. Well, good news, Job. You do have a book, the book of Job. But here's the one, verse 25. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Mike's going to take that. But how could you live if you did not know your Redeemer lives? 
Job had a redeemer, and his name is Jesus.